Well, hi, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. My guest today is Billy Taylor. He is a returning guest. I'm really happy to have him back. Um, we, he was here episodes 293 and 298 from a couple years back, if you want to go check that out. And then more recently, Billy was also my guest on episode five of the My Favorite Mistake podcast series. So um, I recently got to catch up with Billy a little bit at the AME Annual Conference. And before I tell you a little bit more, Billy, welcome back to the podcast. How are you? Thank you, Mark. I'm doing well. And uh, thank you for having me back. I really enjoyed being on those episodes and you and I still talk about them from time to time. So thank you for having me. Yeah, well, thank you for being back. And, you know, thank you, like with the My Favorite Mistake podcast of, of, of being one of the first, you know, being brave enough to share your favorite mistake story and to be you know open about talking about mistakes that really sets a good example uh, for others. So thank you again for that. Thank you. And congratulations on the show. It's doing very well, very well. So I, I'm honored to be one of the first ones to be invited. Yeah. And 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 I will mention, and I'll encourage people, I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Uh, it is the most listened to episode of the My Favorite Mistake podcast by a good margin. So there's the Billy Taylor effect. Thank you again for that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but since uh, we, we last talked, Billy has written and released uh, a, a great book. It's titled The Winning Link, A Proven Process to Define, Align, and Execute Strategy at Every Level. So we're going to be talking about that today. And if you don't know Billy, just in, in a nutshell, and I'll, I'll link to his full bio in the show notes, he had a long career at Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. He served, he had a lot of different uh, leadership roles, including being a plant director in both union and non-union facilities. He was leading lean transformations in Goodyear's largest and most complex tire producing sites. And, and Billy more recently founded his firm, Linked Excel, where he is the CEO and doing a lot of great work uh, with companies out there. So, you know, Billy, before we, we talk about the book, uh, The Winning Link, it, it was great reconnecting with you at AME. And I know you were there for a while. What It's kind of open-ended question, but what stood out to you most? Like what, 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 what's your first recollection of, you know, what was interesting at the AME conference this year? One, the, the content that was being displayed, it was, right, the next generational type of lean experience, right? It's post-COVID. People were excited to be back out and, and, and talking to people, interacting with people. But the content uh, around operational excellence and lean is what, what really impressed me. Uh, some of the guests that were, were uh, the keynote speakers were very, very hands-on. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, they gave you the experience that you can go up and talk to them, that type of experience. And the interactions, uh, I think the, the, the speakers and workshop leaders were more personable because they were just coming back into that we can interact, not through a Zine, a Zoom, I'm sorry, uh, uh teams. Uh that that stood out to me. People wanted to be there. Uh people were embracing the knowledge. Uh and then the follow-up discussions, uh, they were outstanding. Outstanding. Yeah. Well, there were a lot of great speakers. And in a recent episode, Katie Anderson and I talked about Larry Culp, who's the mm -hmm. CEO of GE. Um, Gary Michelle, another uh, CEO, um, Jed Welm, he's re uh, previously CEO of that company up, up, up until recently, you know, both shared really, really great perspectives about the shop floor, the frontline workers, the respect that they both showed and in, in, in talking about their employees. You know, it's uh, mm -hmm. that's that's exactly the example that you would you, you would want to see leaders set at AME. Absolutely. And and like the, the, the Larry Culp, that was very, very good because it was part keynote and part just an open discussion, open dialogue with Katie. Yeah. Uh, that was very, very well received by the audience. Yeah. And, and Katie and I recapped that uh, in that episode. So I encourage people to scroll down a little bit in the feed and they can they can listen to that. Now, Billy, you did a session I, I wish they had you on the main stage, like hopefully next year. But you did a session. It was for the Champions Club group. Is that right? Uh, kind of a fireside chat. A fireside chat where it was uh, it was only personal invite, where they had personal invites, and we just talked about you know how to drive excellence, how to, how to shape culture. Because when you think about leadership and people that are in these roles and they're talking lean transformations. 
I always talk about that respect and value for people that drive change. Mm-hmm. It's like being a, a good parent. I recently saw this. I was watching uh, something on TV and I was watching a teacher really explain to students just the value of life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, 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 and it was very applicable to leadership. It's like I can buy a watch, but I can't buy time. Mm-hmm. I can buy a house. I can buy a mansion, but I can't buy a home. Mm-hmm. And so as leaders, when you go in and you get these big titles, what are you building? Mm -hmm. Are you building an enterprise of ownership, respect, trust, right? You hear me talk about earning the right to change. Mm -hmm. The technical right is you can go out and buy equipment. You can hire associates. But what you don't get is that culture that drives those things. Mm -hmm. Now, when you earn the cultural right, that's a respect and trust. That's the same equivalent of buying that watch in time. Yeah. And so when you go out there uh, in, in, in organizations, and, you, and I see organizations, when I go out there, uh, just this conference when I was having a fireside chat, it was around those leaders that are really driving change, the cultural piece of change. Mm-hmm. And there's really no shortcut when it comes to building trust, I mean, through through your actions, it takes time. I, I I'd love to hear you elaborate on, you know, leaders building trust. How do you first understand the level of trust that exists before you try to to build or strengthen that? Well, I'll just say, seek to understand before you seek to change. Mm-hmm. Right? Don't walk into an organization thinking you know about that organization. You know about the natives. You know what drives your organization because then sometimes it's not a common language, it's a common meaning, right? Because people want to, you want them to understand right now in this, this world of diversity, the workforce that's being hired is are multicultural. Mm-hmm. And so you may have to put your work instructions in a different language until that demographic understands English, but the meaning has to be the same. Those interactions, and right, it takes time. It takes understanding. Uh, it takes interactions. Right. And you have to go to every level of the organization and connect. You have to connect. Um, if you don't, that leader, when mistrust seeks in, you have a problem, mm-hmm. a major problem. Right. And as a leader, you can't just say, hey, I'm new. You should trust me. Right. Right. Or, hey, I'm the, the plant manager. Or, hey, I'm the CEO. Or, hey, I'm this vice president. You should or you must follow me. Mm-hmm. It doesn't work that way. It's not that simple. Yeah. It's not that simple. It's first, see, hey, Mark, how are you doing? I'm Billy Taylor. Tell me about yourself. Mm. Well, I'm from this place as well. And I do this. And, you know, and you invite them in. And, and, and then they'll invite you in. Yeah. Yeah. You can't jump right into... Hi, I'm uh, hi, I'm Mark Graven. I'm new here. What do you think we should improve? Like that might be a little too direct, right? That's right. That's right. It's kind of like the state farm commercial, right? We're Which good neighbor. One? We're a good neighbor because we're there, right? <laughs> <laughs> we're there, right? We're you you can trust us. Yeah. You know, and and that's what good leaders are there, right? Good, good leaders listen, good leaders engage. But it's kind of like my favorite mistake when we talk, right, not holding to my standards. Good leaders set standards and hold the team to those standards, right? That's what make the great coaches in life, Mm -hmm. the great parents in life, right? The great teachers. Those those individuals start with standards Mm -hmm. and they hold to those standards and they make you better for it. Yeah. Yeah. And they help you be able to hold to the standard. I mean, I see in healthcare, different setting than, than you're working in. Um, there, there are real systemic barriers that prevent healthcare providers from holding to the standard when they want to. Mm-hmm. So then people are forced into workarounds or shortcuts. And you know, um, there's, there's that opportunity in healthcare um, for, for the leaders to not shy away from the feedback people are giving about, you know, here are the barriers, we need your help mm-hmm. and, and not just blame people for what they're being forced into doing with the workarounds or the shortcuts, right? Absolutely. As, as my mother would say, uh, son, there's no, there are no shortcuts to success. 
Mm-hmm. And often the shortcut is the long way mm. to success because you, you have to correct some mistakes. You have to correct some things you covered up by taking the shortcut. And so it eventually becomes the long way to success. Mm-hmm. And so once you set standards, now standards are not monuments, right? You can earn the right to change them, mm-hmm. but the good leaders hold to those standards. Yeah. And, you know, I think good leaders also, thinking back to your phrase, uh, you, you talk about being there. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there's this often this advice that's given, you know, leaders need to go out into the gemba or the shop floor or the, the workplace. So being there is important, but how you're being matters too, right? If, we, if leaders go out and, and, and they're out in the workforce and they're, they're yelling and blaming and doing things that, that aren't helping, I mean, there's, 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 there's how you're being while you're being there. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about that, of coaching people through um, developing good habits or new habits for when they're out there. Yeah, it's coaching leaders on how to show up. Mm-hmm. how to show up and, and often you start by showing up as a listener rather than a teller mm-hmm. right because change the best part of change is done with people not to people right and so when you show up uh to the gimba and all you're doing is, is is picking i call it picking corn out of the chicken poop right you're just picking <laughs> out little things and you yeah, you, right. you 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 and people get irritated by that, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? And, and and I often say, ask leaders, ask the person to state what the issue is, and then ask them, what do you need from me? Not what do you want from me? What do you need from me right. to eliminate this constraint, All right? Because often people 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 are seeking uh, to understand you, to understand your commitment as a leader, mm-hmm. and, and 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 no one's a boss. You, yeah. bosses are extinct yeah you know, the way we live with 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 social media and we know more than we've ever known faster than we ever knew it and so leaders are uh i mean people are looking for leaders leaders are partners to success yeah they're not bosses right bosses right. just tell people what to do right that's, that's an outdated term absolutely if not offensive almost i mean the, mm-hmm. the idea boss um but like you said leading with questions leading with humility mm-hmm. and th- and that doesn't mean let me, let me throw this back to you as a question i mean i think sometimes people m- misunderstand a little bit that say oh oh okay lean uh, problems should be solved at lower levels of the organization and we have continuous improvement so uh, i'll just delegate everything to the frontline staff that doesn't really work either, right? How do you find the balance between what leaders need to be doing in addition to their frontline staff and what they're doing? So the, how do, the, the how is being very, very deliberate on how you deploy strategy mm-hmm. because you, people need to know what they own. And so when you break that down, you can really have those, I mean, precise conversations on what it is that the person should be doing and what they own Mm -hmm. inside the strategy. And so when you do that, it's a different discussion than this big, you know, this big massive bowl of we, we own everything. We own safety. Mm -hmm. We own quality. No, what do you own in your part of safety and helping people with, with creating a safe environment? What do you own in quality? And when you can break it down to that point, you can really have those productive discussions, those right, those, those, those that 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 creative problem solving, that scientific thinking. Because when we say we, uh, one of the ladies on my team used to say, when when two people own the dog, the dog dies. Because I thought you fed the dog. No, I thought you fed the dog. No, right. I, I did feed the dog. Well, I fed the dog too. The dog either over eat, overeat or starve. Right. Because we own the dog we don't know who owns what and so that's what i see in companies when 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 these discussions happen these we discussions you know and everybody show up at a board or a huddle board Mm -hmm. and that's one of the things i've seen is one of the least productive things in in enterprises their their daily huddles 
it's more one person talking mm-hmm. or two, but you're just reporting news. You're you're yeah. well, we had a safe night. We have this quality issue. We and then they break like a football huddle and everybody go to yeah. their job, right? Uh productive huddles, what I've seen is they're focused on key KPAs, the key performance actions that we're gonna take. Mm-hmm. That drive the key performance indicator, right? right. Of what we're going to achieve. The KPA says, did we do a safety walk and what did we find? And who's going to address that? Mm-hmm. Did we have any quality alerts, any quality issues? Did we, who who owns it and who's going to address it? Those are productive huddles. Right. And but it's a, it's it, it's systematized and has a process driven. Uh the big collective, everybody owns it. Again, it's one of those terms is, that will get you in trouble. Right. We'll get the leader in trouble. Yeah. You're right. And, you know, thinking first about huddles, it's interesting to observe the body language of a team that's huddling. Where I'd say if uh, there, there, there's an opportunity for improvement, if everyone's just kind of got arms folded, looking at their shoes, looking at their watch, just waiting for the huddle to be over, that that's not a good huddle. There's an opportunity to engage people in a better way, right? Absolutely. I recently was uh, with an organization and they were doing their team huddle and the leader themselves was offended when they got the recommendation to to let others talk about their business in the huddle. Mm-hmm. The leader wanted to do all the talking. Mm-hmm. Well, I've got the data. I'm going to give them the data and then send them to work. And it's like you said, Mark, you watch their body language. They're checking out. Mm-hmm. They're checking out on this individual, and the individual doesn't have the emotional intelligence to see that. Mm. To see that you're not engaging these inso- associates, and they're not going to to buy in to what you're doing because it's not inclusive, right? Not inclusive, and they don't see the value in it. And it seems like if that leader doesn't have the emotional intelligence or isn't reading the room or isn't reading the huddle. It seems like that's where you or another coach can, can help maybe help open their eyes to, to what they're not noticing. And in sort of a, I mean, you know, it's a difficult thing to bring up maybe, but if, if you've got a good coaching relationship, hopefully they're, they're open to you kind of raising the concern to talk about. Right. Yeah. And it's the how, right. To even bring that to their attention. Uh, uh, to say when I'm when I'm coaching, I call it out on the spot in a respectful way. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I make sure that they get the point because uh, some people are in denial, right? They 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 don't see their own flaws and they they have that title itis. That's what I call it, title itis, itis, where they have this big title and they know it all. Mm-hmm. And I'll I'll point out, look at your team. Mm-hmm. Look, look, they're not following you, Mm. right? They're being maliciously obedient, Mm -hmm. right? They're saying, yes, we'll do it. That's what they're saying to you. Yes, they're doing it, but here's what they're thinking. Yes, we'll do it. (laughs) But the head nodding, no. Right, Right, they're not going to do it because they don't buy in. And again, they feel that we as humans, we don't resist change. We resist change being done to us rather than that's when we push back. Right. When you don't involve us in the change, the planning, right? You can come up with what winning is, but how do we connect? How do we own some of this? Because the greatest teams, the greatest sports teams, um, leadership teams, they have buy-in where they they rally around the win. They, they, they own their part of the strategy and they know. They know right? it's like the best, and I'm a huge football fan. Now, I'm a huge Nick Saban fan, not an Alabama fan, <laughs> but a Nick Saban fan because Nick is very deliberate around letting every player know what they own in the daily in, in the strategy, in the daily strategy. Mm-hmm. And if you jump off sides or get a penalty on a Nick Saban team and he's up, by 45 points, yeah. the game's out of reach. No way the other team can come back and beat you. But but Mark Raven, if you jumped off sides, you're going to hear about it in the film session. Yeah. Right? Because you violated the standard. Yeah. It 
it's a, a process problem, even though the result of the game was good. Absolutely, because the next game you may be down seven points and they're on the verge of winning the game and you jump offside and it costs the whole team the victory. So he's correcting those things that may hurt the organization or hurt the enterprise. Mm-hmm. And, 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 but the person that jumped offside, they are aware that that's not acceptable. And sure. that's when you start to win. Right. When people own it, they know what the strategy is. They own it and they know their piece of it. That's what's important. Yeah, because when, when, when often when I talk, Mark, I'll say strategy plus execution equals results. Mm-hmm. And then people say, well, if that if it's that easy, why doesn't it happen? <laughs> I said the plus. See, the plus is what's so vague in strategy. Strategy plus execution plus is who owns what in the strategy. Who owns what at every level of the organization? And I talk about if I was when I was at Goodyear, if I needed to make thirty eight thousand tires a day. And I had 38 tire builders. That means each one of you have to get 1,000 tires a day. Mm -hmm. If you don't get your 1,000, you have let the team down. Mm -hmm. And so they took pride in getting 1,100. Yeah. Right? They knew what winning was. But you, I'm sure in that situation, you equipped them to do that. Nick Saban equips his team to win through the talent that he brings in through through the system, through the practice, through the training, through the discipline. You can't just grab any 80 students and throw throw pads on them and say, hey, go win, and then blame them for not winning when Alabama Absolutely. beats them 400 to nothing. <laughs> Absolutely. He equips them. Well, one, he goes and gets the best people. He has the best tools. Mm-hmm. And his processes are married to both of those to drive excellence. Yeah, I saw so many of his kids this morning uh, that jumped into the the transfer portal to go to a different school. There were five star, four stars at one time that for whatever reason, they're not getting much playing time under 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 Nick Saban. Yeah, well, it's it's Nick standard. That's all I'm going to say. But I do know I, I guarantee you, Mark. That at the start of next season. Nick Saban will be in the top five. Yeah. yeah. Or his leadership standards will be in the top five. Right. <laughs> and I think there's an interesting parallel there. Uh, it's not just about getting the best people. I mean, there yeah. are football programs out there, I'm sure, that have really highly rated recruiting classes year after year that kind of underperform Absolutely. to the Nick Saban standard or the, the Dabo Sweeney standard mm-hmm. or Let's say, well, it's going to be interesting to see what he's going to do at Colorado. The Deion Sanders standard, who's been incredibly successful at Jackson State. You know? Absolutely. Very, very much so. But he went into the locker room. Uh, I was watching something on his introduction to his players. He started with talking about his standards. Mm, wow. And what it's going to take to make his team if you're an existing player. He talked about. Those things on what what it takes to win, not a big promise that we're going to be great. Uh, The great Pat Summit from Tennessee, Mm -hmm. she was the same way. She started with the standard that that's what those were the leaders I really studied. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's going to be interesting to see what Deion Sanders does. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. But Mm -hmm. here's the other thing. People are in the portal or trying to get his attention. Yeah. Right. They want to play for a coach like that. Mm-hmm. So people now uh, it, it's like a magnet. Right. The, the, they're, they're attracting mm-hmm. Colorado is already attracting some of the best players in the country. Yeah. To the leadership standard. Yeah. Well, and then it's interesting to see, you know. Uh, the standard that exists for hiring a coach. Who knows if that's the right standard? Because people kind of wondered, like, well, you hired Deion Sanders. I don't think he, I don't think he, I mean, he hadn't gone through the traditional path of being an assistant coach. And uh, people questioned that. Or, you know, the Indianapolis Colts recently hired a former player to be a coach who I think had coached a little bit in high school, but he was on ESPN. And, you know, it's, it's interesting the challenge. Is that a standard? You talked earlier about 
standard isn't a monument. Maybe That's some right. of the standards are outdated. If someone is a leader, um, they they can you know hire people to do some of the tactical things related to the coaching. Maybe we yes. need to look in in different settings. And I'll I'll draw a parallel to healthcare here. The standard of who can be a hospital CEO. That standard has generally been somebody who's moved up through the ranks in healthcare. It's yes. interesting when that standard gets challenged. Somebody's brought in from a non-traditional background, and sometimes Absolutely. that's their biggest strength. Absolutely. And I think, and I watch the best coaches, uh, the Pat Summons, the, the Sabins, even Dion. Mm -hmm. They hired the best people around them, meaning assistant coaches. Right. They That's what they got right. And they were able to let go without letting loose. Mm. Right. And so they let those coaches do their job. They went out and got the best coaches uh, to surround them with. If you ever watch a game, Nick is not really coaching the game. Mm -hmm. He's coaching the environment. Yeah. And holding his coaches to a standard. He's not coaching the game. I watched Dion. He wasn't coaching the game when they, they won the championship Saturday. He wasn't coaching the game. He was coaching the environment. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I would often say when I was in corporate America, yeah, I'm a pretty smart guy. I've got 13 degrees, right? And people say, what do you mean you have 13 degrees? I earned two and I hired 11, <laughs> right? And I use all 13 of them. Yeah. Right? I, 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 I hired to complement my weaknesses or my gaps. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I put the best coaching group on the field. To, to manage my team. Yeah. And I think a good leader in any setting isn't threatened, hopefully isn't threatened by the talented people that they've hired to be part of their team. I'm saying like, oh, this person could replace me someday. Um, you know, sometimes in sports, there are accusations that, you know, a head coach doesn't, you don't want to feel threatened by their offensive coordinator or their defensive coordinator. But yes. like talent's got to attract talent and not be threatened. Right. Talent, right. Right. You want the best talent on your team. And, you know, no matter who you are, if you're the smartest person on that team by far, you're in bra. You have a problem. Mm -hmm. You have a problem. Right. Because, you know what, Mark, there are some things that I am, I'm, I'm better at than you would be. And there's things that you're much better at than I would be. But collectively, mm -hmm. we can be better than anyone else at this. And so that's when you realize where humility has its place. Mm -hmm. Humility and respect has its place in trust. It's no different than you and I being on a podcast today, right? It's, it's that mutual respect, that value proposition. I value being on your podcast. You value having me on your podcast. And that's what works. Sure. That's what works. That's where that mutual respect and trust comes in. And, and that same as leading teams. I value to put people on my team and, and, you know, they value being on my team. Yeah. You know, and, and together, right. We, we make things happen. We, 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 we drive positive change. Yeah. So I'm going to ask one football, one more football question, looking for analogies to, to, uh, you know, our workplaces, but um, before we talk about the book, speaking of making things happen, Billy, making the book happen, the winning link, we'll talk more about that. But you talked earlier about Nick Saban and his his coaching and his standards. And I've blogged about this. He talks about the process. You know, he's mm -hmm. big into process. Mm -hmm. And you, 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 you brought up a situation where a player jumps offside. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes you get away with it. Official doesn't see it. Does that get pointed out as an opportunity for improvement? Like, hey, you you jumped offside, but you lucked out. Absolutely. Let's learn, let's learn from that, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the shortcut piece, right? You can't praise. And, and I say it like this. Think about the process. Celebrate the process. Embrace the individual. Mm -hmm. Because you have to have those hard conversations, those transparent conversations, because that person can feel that that's okay. Sure. That's okay. It's like if your kid shoplifted or something and you find out two or three weeks later, you don't say that's okay. Right. Because you got away with it. No, not at all. No. Yeah. Because what? If you say that's okay, 
you're going to enforce the behavior that that's okay. And that person is going to do it again. Uh The next time they will get caught. Yeah. They will get caught. And, And, you know, being raised by a very stern mother, you know, parent, that was it. You know, those, those things she didn't let pass by. Mm-hmm. She, she didn't let go. She always took the opportunity to talk about things you could do to be better. Now, she celebrated things we did well. But when I say focus on the process, the process is you don't jump off sides. Yeah. You got away with that one. Yeah. And how do we get away with something or passing on poor quality? Mm-hmm. But here's the one, Mark, that really jumps out when you say that jumping off sides. You violated a safety issue. Right. And the leader let it go. Walk past it. Yeah. You violated a lockout tag out situation so that people can get more production. And the leader looked the other way. Right. Now, a week later, you go in and you violate that bypass and it results in a fatality. Mm-hmm. Had the leader addressed it then, right. that associate would not have did it a second time. Right. But because you got away with it that time, it ended in a, a serious injury or fatality. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I say, you know, you have to hold to those standards, you know, and going back to your statement earlier, you can't rely on getting lucky. Right. Right? Or you can't take the shortcut because you know what? And even in that incident, the shortcut was the long way. Right. And there, there, there was a story in the news recently about, um, I won't name names, but a large global manufacturer that makes big, heavy equipment had an employee who was killed in a factory. And the, the, there was a big OSHA fine, and, and and it sounds like the story, at least my reading of it, was that um, there there was uh, some equipment that was often jamming, like this, I think, metal extrusion factory. And what you were saying reminded me of the story, Billy, where um, the employee was allowed to, or maybe even taught, to jump over safety barricading and unjam the machine without doing a tag out lockout, and they probably got away with it a bunch of times, and then. One time there there was a big boom arm that came around and hit the worker in the head, killed instantly. Yes. It's tragic, but I mean, that's just that, 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 that shouldn't happen if people are holding to the standard and, and, and putting principles above keep production going. That's right. And you can't, that's unacceptable in any case. Um, You know, the processes and the standards are there to protect the worker, mm-hmm. the customer, and the company. Right. And and so when people are allowed, and it goes back to 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 disregard or bypass the standard, you're putting the customer at risk. You're putting the 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 company at risk. And you talked about the huge fine that's leveraged against that company. But think about the person that lost their life. Mm-hmm. Think about that family member, right, that that lost their loved one. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I mean by, you know, I've, I had a great relationship with the union. Um, any place I've ever worked, the union would vouch. Anytime I post something, even on social media, the, the union members comment positively. It's because our relationship, our respect, and our trust. But I remember early on in my career having a conversation with a senior union rep. And it was around a person that was violating a safety issue, a safety rule. And I disciplined him. Uh, basically, we walked him out. Mm-hmm. And the person wanted to, to represent them. And I said, do you know that person was inches away from killing someone? And you're here and we're having this discussion? Mm-hmm. Because if it had been the other way, you'd have been leading the charge on suing. You'd have been saying we were wrong and we don't care about safety. Right. And that person, that person thought about it, came back to my office. He goes, I never looked at it from that perspective. Mm-hmm. Now, he said, Bill, I have to do my job. And I said, I understand doing your job. But you're putting others at risk when you accept that. Right. 
right? A person drinking on the job or a person, you know, violating a rule, that, that's some things you shouldn't even, shouldn't be negotiable for you. Right. That's an absolute. And so when I talk about standards, there's certain things I just don't negotiate. Right. I, I just, I just, it's a standard. And that's when I say, I, 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 I recently saw an organization that I thought was phenomenal around safety concerns. They were, we were recognizing people for following safety standards. Recognizing now, they didn't write people up there that, that, that they found violating. They coached those people. Uh huh. So when you're talking standards, that's what drives an enterprise. Mm -hmm. That's what, you know, you check into a hotel room, you have standards. If the sheets were all messed up <laughs> and you're, you're going downstairs because there's a standard on what you expect when you walk in the door right. in the hotel room. And so that's what I see in organizations. And there's some gaps, the, the gaps in leadership, ability to set standards and then hold people to the standard. Right. Based on principles as opposed to the title. I have the title. I can tell you what the standard is as opposed to holding to it because it's principled such as safety first. Nobody should get hurt. Absolutely. Principles and like that. Yes. The title don't entitle you for anything. Yeah. Right. They don't. The, the, and, 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 and leaders get that. Uh, confused, I believe, uh, some leaders, not most, but some, as they go up the ladder, uh, they believe that they're invincible. Uh, and then reality hits. And where reality hits, it's a difficult, it's a difficult conversation. Right. Yeah. A difficult reality in most cases. Well, again, we're we're talking with Billy Taylor here today, and I promise we're going to talk about the book. So let's let's make sure we don't run out of time without talking about the winning link, a proven process to define, align, and execute strategy at every level. When you know, in the in the book, you know, before we, there's different parts of strategy that we can talk to you here, but but back to the idea of winning, and you write about the need to define winning. Are are, are there times when that? Is a difficult conversation where there, where, where there's a lack of agreement around our our organization's definition of winning. Absolutely. Um, when, when again, think about the voice. People want a voice. It starts with how you develop strategy. Mm -hmm. Right, getting everyone, getting the critical, the the and I say everyone, the key stakeholders, the key players in the room, so they have a voice. Mm -hmm. And, and and when you do that, um, I think you get that total alignment uh, on what strategy is and the and the how at the top from an enterprise perspective. But there's small branches of that strategy that has to go out to the enterprise, mm -hmm. right? So there's this, this strategy for the enterprise, and then there's a connected business model that says the branch of safety, the branch of quality. The branch of material movement, right? The branch of continuous improvement. Those are smaller strategies or spokes of the whole wheel mm -hmm. of strategy. And so when they know the process of which they're going to develop the strategy and they're going to be accountable to drive, to, to build a, the, that branch strategy, that's when you get the that involvement, that engagement that you, you, you're looking for. Mm -hmm. We do a process called purpose mapping. We start with the purpose. And then what we do, we break down from the purpose of the enterprise. Then we talk about the purpose of that branch. Mm -hmm. Right? So enterprises want to safely make, I'm just making this up, mm -hmm. safely make products on time and full at the right, right cost while serving as good stewards. Okay. That's good. Somebody in the break area, everybody understands that. Now, what's the strategy for safety? What's the purpose? Right? To protect our people, our environment, our company, everyone home safe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that branch is a, again feeds back up into the overall statement. And so what we the key thing is that inclusiveness of building strategy and being very deliberate mm -hmm. on what winning is. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna hear me talk about deliberate clarity. 
as clarity of the enterprise and every individual function. Deliberate ownership. Hmm. That's who owns everything inside that strategy at every level. So it's breaking that strategy. That's real strategy deployment. Yeah. It's deliberate ownership. And then the next part is deliberate practice. Mm -hmm. That's that continuous improvement journey, right? Scientific thinking. And so when you get, when you connect those things together, you start to build this, this trust, this organization, the enterprise trust Mm -hmm. and buy it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. One thing I hear you saying is we've got to agree on purpose first. Absolutely. Like our strategy can't be so limited or, or dictated in a top-down way. Like to say our, our goal is to be a leader in all of our businesses, and we're, we, we, we're, we have certain goals around the stock price and return on net assets. Like, well, that, that probably that doesn't engage people the way talking about deeper purpose would, right? That's right. That is correct. Yeah. You know, in, in the true essence of the book, uh, even uh, and I'll just share the cover. Yeah. It had people. Those links. links. Yep. The winning link starts with that people aspect. Uh, but the, 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 the core essence of it, if you ask me to sum it up in, a, in, a, in what it means, it's how we win. Mm-hmm. The winning link, it's really about just how we win. I don't care if it's manufacturing, it's the medical industry, it's youth sports, Mm -hmm. uh, it's a nonprofit. Um, How we win is consistent. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, uh, well, I was just going to ask you, as we define winning and then we have an idea about our strategy and we've gotten input from other people, it probably means it's more likely to be a good strategy, if you will. But how, how do we know if our definition of strategy or our definition of winning is the quote unquote right strategy? How do we know it's really a differentiating strategy? How, how do we test that or figure that out as opposed to knowing that we're right? So what we do is we develop purpose statements. Excuse me. We develop a purpose statement and then we identify what's a CPI. What's your critical performance indicator? And you can only have up to two. You can't exceed two. And and what we ask companies and leaders to do is, if this doesn't happen, you're going out of business. Mm -hmm. So it can be EBITDA or it could be customer service, whatever it is. What's your CPI? What's your critical performance indicator? And then what we do, Mark, is we do a part of where we assess your current reality. Are you really capable of delivering what you want, what you your purpose? Uh, how do you know you identify what winning is to the enterprise? And then you start to identify what are the KPA, the key performance actions you're going to take and how you're going to measure those actions. Mm -hmm. So what would happen, Mark, if, if I did this, uh, if I'm safe, my quality's bad, uh, my delivery's good, my maintenance is good. Really, where do I need to go focus, right? I need to go focus on my quality. And is that a really affecting my CPI? So we tie everything back to these two major things we say are right. And how do you know if the strategy is right? The strategy is based on the actions you're going to take. Mm-hmm. Your strategy is not a paragraph to say, hey, here's what we're going to do. It's around the actions you're going to take, mm-hmm. right? How, how, where are you going to focus? To achieve what you want. Now, if you're getting, how do you know if that's wrong? If you're if you're delivering, if you if you if I say I'm gonna make a thousand widgets and that's what success is, and I'm making a thousand widget widgets and we're not selling them. Right. Well, maybe you should have had two CPIs. This is one, a thousand widgets, and a thousand widgets sold. Right. Right on time and full, and so that's how you start to test, you know, your strategy. But your strategy is based around actions you're going to take. Right. Your strategy should be based on where you're going to focus, and then you should measure that. They shouldn't just be sentences, vague sentences. Sentences. They should be things that you're going to focus and track, 
So right. you know if your strategy is working. Right. And that's but, where you're, you're gauging the execution. How well are we executing? Or if we're executing well, if we're executing the wrong strategy well, we may learn that over time. Because here's the deal. If you don't get the CPI right, the rest is a bunch of no a noise. Again, when I go into clients, here's what I do. And I have a PowerPoint slide and I pull up a football scoreboard. and But I don't put the score on there. Right. But I do put a lot of information on the scoreboard. There's one minute left, Mark. It's the fourth quarter. You have the ball, Mark, on the 10-yard line, first down. Mark, what's your strategy? <laughs> There's no score on the board. Right. Though. Yeah. What's your I, strategy? I, yeah, it it depends. Am I running out the clock because I'm ahead or am I desperately trying to catch up like Tom Brady did last night? <laughs> As, so it depends on your CPI. Yeah. Getting that critical performance indicator right, what you're going to measure. Now, watch this. It's, it's amazing when I do this with professionals. Uh, and, and more so, I, I love to see women in this scenario that, that some cases, they don't really know the game, but they get the message and they take over. Yeah. They literally take over. And we're, we're like, clarity. So, Mark, if the score is 40, you have 40. The opposing team has zero. You have the ball. First down, what are you going to do? One minute left. You're up by 40 points. Yeah, I'm going to take a knee. I'm running out the clock. Run out the clock, yeah. right? Unless you're Ohio State playing Michigan, they're going to try to score again. <laughs> now, let's go Let's go again. What happens if you have zero and the opposing team has seven hmm. and there's one minute left? Yeah. Are you going to kick a field goal? No. no. Think about this, how quick you went there with your strategy. Mm -hmm. You know what to do and what not to do. And that's why it's important to get the CPI right. Mm -hmm. What's the critical performance indicator that you're going to measure? Because if you don't get that right, that deliberate clarity, define winning. In the book, I say, do this right. And I ask people, I say, write this down. Have you clearly defined what winning is at every mm -hmm. level? Deliberate mm -hmm. clarity. Two. Have you aligned yourself to win? So as you, you've cascaded the strategy, define, you've aligned, so everybody knows what they own, deliberate ownership, and now you execute. That's right. deliberate practice. And so that's kind of what, when I, when I read, when I wrote the book, it was around things, my favorite mistakes, Mark. It was around things that I saw didn't work as I was coming up in a 30-year career. And then I've worked with some major consultants in industries, some powerhouses, and some things I've learned through successes and failures, what worked, what didn't work. Mm -hmm. I shifted those things out and said, this is what people should embrace when they're really driving excellence in their, their enterprise. Mm -hmm. And you, you know that question you asked, Billy. Um, have you defined what winning means to you? That's making me think. For the work I do, have I defined? I'm busy. I'm doing things. I'd like to get like, a few strategic intents. Mm -hmm. But you're you're really making me think. I need I need to sit down and take some time to think through and write out and talk through what winning means to me personally with the work I do in my business. Absolutely. You know, and Mark, that's why we use a purpose map. It's really a one page. It's we call it the soap. It's a strategy on a page. And once we go through it, it starts with the purpose statement. It provides such clarity mm -hmm. around like and it's just like you were describing. Define winning. If you don't, def it's like meeting when you show up to a meeting and the leader has not clearly defined what winning is in that meeting. It's just a, a bunch of noise mm. for the the outcome of that particular meeting. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. But when I define what 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 Winnie is coming in out of this meeting, and then I align, we're going to go around the room, and here's what you own, and I want to hear from you. The exiting that meeting is the taking action. What are we going to do? And then the follow up meeting is what was done. Mm -hmm. 
right? And so it simplifies uh, strategy deployment. It, stra- it simplifies how we win, how we yeah. win. And then I know if I'm winning because it's just like the scoreboard. Okay, I'm tracking first downs. I'm tracking rushing yardage. I'm tracking all these things we track. They're irrelevant mm-hmm. if what? And, and I had this conversation with my younger brother recently. We're both, we're all, we come from a family of Dallas Cowboys. And mm-hmm. we're talking about some personnel. And then I, he, he said, this person was one of the best players at that position. I says, how can you say that? And it was, it was a discussion between Troy Aikman and Tony Romo. Mm-hmm. And I said, Troy Aikman is the best quarterback in Dallas Cowboy history. <laughs> and my brother says, why do you say that? I says, you won three Super Bowls. Yeah. He says, well, Romo had this many stats. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. what's winning? Yeah. Super Bowl. The ultimate goal is to win the Super Bowl. And I said, would you rather have a quarterback that threw for 3,000 yards, but they lost in the first round of the playoffs, or a quarterback that threw for 2,000 yards right. and won three Super Bowls? There's the Super Bowls. Yeah, there's the un, there's the unanswerable thought experiment of if you had a time machine and Tony Romo could go back in time and beat out Troy Aikman for the starting job, would he have won three or even four Super Bowls? We don't. We never. We never know. You never know. Yeah. And so, you know, when I say when you get that right, what they did right in that era to get three Super Bowls, they define align themselves with the best talent. And they executed a great strategy, which made them winners. Right. And the purpose was to what? Win a Super Bowl. Yeah. So your your framework, and and, and again, I'll, I'll read the title of the book and the subtitle. So the title of Billy's book is The Winning Link, A Proven Process to Define, Align, and Execute Strategy at Every Level. So I keep, I, you're, you're, you keep making me think of those three words. So whether it's strategy for the year, strategy long term, or even the outcomes of that meeting, have we defined the problem? Have we designed, defined what we're going to do? Are we aligned on those actions? That's right. And we can't just come up with the what we think is a great idea. We've got to execute and have some measures, come back and have some feedback loops to make sure we're not just plowing forward with our execution, but we're willing to maybe go back and redefine or realign if needed. Is that fair to say? That's right. And that's the PDCA right. part of it. That's, that's that connection there that we have to call some, right, some audibles. We have to do some things differently because this, this part of the strategy isn't working. Mm-hmm. So we'll just, yes. Yeah. So and, and, and I'm glad you mentioned the PDSA cycles because, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of times leaders want to think very definitively, very linearly. We define the strategy. We're going to force people to <clears throat> align to it. And then we're going to go execute it. And we're going to be stubborn or in denial or you know refuse to accept the real reality, even if the scoreboard is showing that we're down 41 to 3. That's right. That's right. <laughs> we had the right strategy. Well, yeah. maybe you didn't. Or maybe you, know, right. maybe you have the right strategy poorly executed. And you have to, Mark, one thing is they have to know their personnel. Your personnel may not be capable of delivering Mm -hmm. that strategy. So know your personnel. Yeah. If you've got, this is lapsing back in the football talk again. Uh, Yeah, if you've got a backup quarterback who um, doesn't pass as well as the starting quarterback, you may adjust the plays you're calling to better suit that quarterback's uh, abilities or skill set or if they don't know the playbook as well you're gonna limit your dial back and limit what 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 you call what play you call but i I love your scenario of like the situational decision making of what play are you going to call with a minute left you know Mm -hmm. um, having having structure and a system as a team uh, doesn't mean you, you can't possibly script out every play you're going to call like sometimes right. teams will quote unquote script the first five plays of the game the first time they get the ball. Like maybe you can do that. Mm-hmm. But if but even then, like if if you have this plan for the first five plays and the first play has a bad snap over the quarterback's head and you lose 20 yards, you're you're gonna have to get off script. That's right. That plan is no longer 
the plan or no longer the right plan. Yeah. Yeah. And and sometimes you have to call some audibles, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Based on what's in front of you, what are the challenges that are in front of you, the situation in front of you, right? It can't be just that scripted. There's a core plan, but right, there's some intangible, some things that we don't, we can't control. Yeah. We, but we I think when you have alignment around strategy and principles, it's probably easier to realize what decisions we should make in a certain situation. So let's say end of a game, you, you mm-hmm. talk about, okay, it's 40 to nothing. Maybe one of our principles is, uh, I'm not trying to pick on Ohio State because you mentioned them earlier, but <laughs> just saying in general, um, if our team has a principle of, you know, it's sportsmanship, we're not going to run up the score. Um, we're going to put all the, the third stringers in and we're just going to run the ball up the middle and we're not trying to score again. But let's say there's a, a system like the college football playoff that almost incentivizes you to say, well, it's going to look better if we win 52 to nothing than mm-hmm. if we had won 38 to nothing. Absolutely. So mm, my principle of sportsmanship maybe goes to the side and we're like, I may apologize to the other coach and the other coach may understand. Absolutely. Hey, I didn't want to do that, but those are the rules of not just the game, but the rules of the system. Right. And, and think about why would you do that, Mark? That's a perfect example. You're going to go back to your purpose of why you're playing the season mm-hmm. to get to the college football playoffs. Mm-hmm. So that decision was required. And it wasn't immoral, unethical, right, or illegal. Sure. Now, those are my things that I really focus on when I deal with every individual, moral, ethically, right, and legal. Mm-hmm. And so by scoring that, I'm going to go back to you. I did that, and I said, you know what, traditionally, you know, even when I saw the coach, you may not like it, but I'm like, you know, a great game, prepare your team, you know, didn't want to go to the last touchdown. That's right. It's, it's 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 between us and Bama getting into the championship. He might get mad and walk away. I can explain that. Yeah. So it goes back to my purpose. What's your purpose? Mm-hmm. What's your you know my purpose in life is to be a great father and a provider, right, for my family, great husband. So I do that. There's things I align with that. Yeah. And I do things to. To show value, it's funny. I'm on a business trip, and my husband's in, my 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 son's in in the area. First thing we did was had dinner. Yeah, I could see this this this, this joy on his face. It fits yeah. into my purpose in life. Mm-hmm. No matter how tired I, I would be, or to call my daughter, you know, every other day, it's just to say hi. Yeah, it's part of my purpose. Make people visible, and they make you valuable. That's so part of how you define winning? That's it. Yeah, that's it. So maybe one one last question uh, for you, Billy. Um, you know, in the book you talked about, um, I think this is really powerful: making jobs better instead mm-hmm. of making jobs go away. Yes, through improvement. And in and, and a minute ago, you you talked about moral, legal, ethical. Like making jobs go away is not illegal, mm-hmm. and, you know. Um, but it, it it it's a matter of, I mean, you know, it comes down to principles. Uh, mm-hmm. How, how, how would you talk through if somebody's saying, well, I, I hear what you're saying, that this would be the ideal about not making jobs go away, but we need to hit our numbers. Yeah. And so and I'm going to start with the need of I'm going to say America. America doesn't have a hiring problem right now. They have a retention problem. Right. Companies are hiring two to three workforces. Uh, you know, I've observed a company that hired three workforces this year. They have 300 plus employees full time. They've hired over 1,200 people this year. Hmm. Okay. Um, people are not quitting pay. People are not quitting um, just the, the, the job. They're quitting the environment. They're quitting, right? COVID introduced a different way of life. The new workforce is into a better working environment. Uh, and not just being inclusive. Um, jobs right now, when you say go away, you know, lean in the old days was if we get better, they're going to cut my job. No, you really want to even the smallest intangibles. Making jobs better is hearing that voice 
of the leader running that 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 not department that operator is what I mean the definition of a leader how do we make that job that person's job better hmm. more inclusive they're recognized for what they do they're visible your visual management systems uh the upkeep and housekeeping they have a voice that's what I mean by making it better give employees a voice and let that voice ring loud mm-hmm. uh, and, 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 and let them feel value. And one of the things that I talk about in the book, too, is psychological safety. Psychological safety is just as harmful as physical safety. Right. Right. If 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 I don't feel comfortable saying something to my leader or I'll be reprimanded, you know, they're going to pass on poor quality. Right. They're going to pass on things. They're going to ignore unsafe conditions because it's easier to ignore it than to talk to you about it. Mm-hmm. And so that whole thing around making the job better, that's not only the, 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 the physical assets, the equipment, the productivity. That's also around the culture. How do they feel about working in there? How do they right that piece, the break area experience? When I'm going to eat my lunch or I'm going in to use the bathroom, that's all inclusive of that. Mm-hmm. And if I don't, if I walk in the cafeteria and it's filthy, that says you don't care about me. Because right. I bet you if I go to the salary cafeteria, mm-hmm. it's pretty nice. Mm-hmm. It, the salary break room, it's pretty nice. You know, I, I, I last week I was in a uh, an organization. I thought that the 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 bathroom for the associates was at a, a five star hotel. Yeah, <laughs> I mean the plant leader had it with some of the most exquisite tile and everything. And you know what? All the people wanted to show me before we got to their area was their bathroom. Mm-hmm. Nice. And then he laid out what's the plan for doing the whole plant, making it better. Mm-hmm. See that whole thing of better now is inclusive. We are a different culture now. The COVID changed the way we do business. Mm-hmm. COVID, COVID made a new style, a new level of leader. The, right? The, the 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 people now that are because of the internet, Zoom, the operator now has a different skill set, a different mindset mm-hmm. of what good looks like. Right. And and they're going to hold you to that standard or they're not going to work for you. Yeah. Well, we could do a whole conversation about that, that topic alone. So maybe some other time we can uh, get together and explore that more. But Billy, this is, you know, it's been great chatting with you and, you know, you, a lot of important things well said um, during the conversation here and the same goes with the book. Um, so again, Billy Taylor has been our guest today, The Winning Link, a proven process to define, align, and execute strategy at every level. Um, you can find Billy's website at linkedxl.com, and I'll, I'll put links to all of that uh, in the show notes. So Billy, it's been you know so great having you back uh, here on the podcast. I'm really glad I could see you in person back in Dallas at AME. That's you know, the the Zoom time here is no substitute for that, but I'm glad we could do both. Absolutely. Uh definitely enjoy catching up with you. Always an honor to be on your podcast. Uh definitely as a big supporter uh of Mark Graven. And, and it's not because of Mark Graven has a podcast, it's because of the person that Mark Graven is. And that's the thing that I, I value most about you and our relationship. And I wish you nothing but the best, my friend. Well, thank. Uh, that's very kind of you, Billy. Thank you, and certainly wish uh, you the best and um, everything you're doing. And uh, I'm, I'm glad the book is getting such great reviews and that it's doing so well. Um, but I appreciate you not because of that, but I, I appreciate you um, for for who you are and being a friend here. So thank you for that. Thank you, and all the best yeah. to everyone. Yes, take care. <laughs>